man is Matt, welcome back to the shop. And today we are talking about Snowman <laughs> Buttons. Fucking buttons. How dare you? So today we're talking about cryo hardening or cryo treatment and stuff like that. This is generally well, this is for steels. And you'll see in the blurb about uh, crankshafts and uh, conrods. I will get to it. Um, so you might have heard this thing called cryo hardening. And what the hell is that? So basically, we have to do a bit more of the metallurgy and understand what's going on. So you have a car. Oh fucking hell! This pen's done in it. So basically, you have a carbon. Oh god, that's just as bad. Fuck me. Forget the blues. Um, you have a. We will get there. You have a, a carbon iron diagram. Um, so you have a temperature up here, and you have carbon content here. Now I will do an entire video, well, a couple of videos, on the uh, iron carbon phase diagram because there's a lot, lot to it. Perlite, cementite, martensitic, austenitic, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, basically what you do is, is that um, you raise the temperature of your uh, steel. <coughs> you kind of hold it there so it saturates. This is, this is basically, or it can be, uh, this is carburization um, or nitriding, depending what atmosphere or basically what surface treatment you give it before you do this. Um, Basically, you hold it at temperature for a while to make sure that you have um, through hardening. So the entire steel, if you imagine you've got a shaft like this, your heat source is exterior to this. Um, so basically, the steel starts to warm up like an onion from the outside in. And then if you are too quick when you do quenching, which we'll get to in a second, uh, which is rapid cooling, um, the, the centre can be soft. Now, sometimes we do this on purpose. A uh, good example is samurai swords and stuff like that. They were like that. Uh, but, uh, uh, gears. Your gears are surface hardened. Or they have a, harden a hardened region which is on the exterior. Um, why would you want to do this? Same with samurai swords. Is that if you had a samurai sword that is completely hard. You hit it against something. It's just going to shatter into bits. It is too brittle. It does not want to elastically deform. It basically just cracks. It'd be like making a sword out of glass. Um, if you can use two different types of steel and wedge them together, which is what they do with samurai swords, you have a blade that is hard and sharp like glass. Or just hard, and then you sharpen it. And then the inside, the core of the blade, and more of the back of the blade, is softer. Softer things that are malleable can take more impacts because they can basically um, compress and twist and have tensile stresses be pulled and they are more malleable to that in a sense like stretch armstrong or a bit of rubber you can pull it and it'll always come back to the way it was you cannot get a ceramic plate or a piece of glass and start pulling it twisting it it will break so you basically leave this up here at this temperature you hold it at that temperature if you're doing through hardening which is means you're trying to harden the whole thing um, this just allows the heat to saturate, so the whole thing is at the same temperature. But anyway, um, when you do this, uh, the steel becomes austenetic. And this is all to do with, uh, this is face centre cubic. Um, we need to go into more into that because it can confuse people. Because um, when you look at carbon contents and stuff, there isn't enough carbon to go around. It's not all the same throughout, it's just regions, grain structures and blah. But anyway, what you do is, is then you quench this. So you basically dip this in water or something like that. Uh, oil, there's, there's three main ways you do it. You do oil, water or there's also air, depending on the steel itself. Air means you just let it cool. Usually we call that normalising, um, annealing, sorry. This basically, you raise the temperature up 
and then you will let it air cool and drag gradually come down. Depending on the steels, there are some steels, uh, A2 steel for example, which is the air dry one, then there's W2 which is the water one, and so on. You can actually even oil quench and water quench A2. It just depends on the alloys, depends what they specify and what they put in it. Um, so it's the chemical composition. When um, your steel drops back down here, it becomes martensitic. And basically, we've now shifted, in a sense, to both body centre cubic sometimes <laughs> and, uh, what's it called? It's tetra. Oh! I've just, it's just gone. Tetra something cubic. Tetra, fuck! I can't remember, I'll put it on the screen. <laughs> it's too busy thinking about oil and water. But anyway, um, and you get some cementite perlite. It's, it's, very, it's actually very complicated. This is why there's an entire science and there's a massive section on the iron carbon. Um, but uh, yes, your carbon saturation can go up slightly, so on and so forth. It's not really the best to put this on the carbon diagram, so we'll just ignore that. Um, but yeah, basically what you do is you heat it up and then you quench it, you stick it into water. So, in a nutshell, you have steel that has a structure um, where there's an atom on the faces like a, a, a die, like a, you know, a dice, uh, like so. And this has, when it's carbon and iron, which is an alloy, it has a, a strength quality, but it has a hardness quality, and it has a malleability. And this is mild steel, and it's quite soft compared to hardened steels. When you add heat into all this, you are basically putting energy in. So this is uh, energy or heat. You're putting energy in. This allows the atoms to move around. Basically, in a sense, the whole thing starts to vibrate, the oscillations are a measurement of temperature, and the atoms become a bit, you know, they expand, they are literally further away from each other, they have more energy so they can repel each other more, and they basically leave gaps when they do that, and atoms can squeeze in. So when you heat it up, what happens is, is when you have your um, face centre cubic, like this, it transforms so there's an atom on the inside, like so. So we've got to put these lines on it. It's like it's suspended inside there. Now this is while it's at high temperature. So we'll just say this is 20 degrees C, and then we'll just say this is 780 to 900, something like that, degrees C, like so. The problem is, is when we cool it back down again, it's going to resort straight back to this face centre cubic malarkey. Now, like I say, this is a bit of both worlds. It's hard-ish. It's hard-ish. And it's malleable. Right? Hardened steel, or, stro you know, hard steel is... Well, hard, it loses a lot of its malleability. This is why when you want to bend something, you heat it up. You get a torch out. You heat it up, you make that, you're basically dumping energy into the system. So when you try and literally dislocate these atoms, these crystals, they're more likely to do so. This is why we heat stuff up to bend it. The problem is, is that this is at this high temperature. <laughs> so the steel is soft as fuck, but the structure inside has changed. And if we could cool this, if we could keep this structure at room temperatures, it would be a lot harder. So that's what we do. We dump this in water so the temperature drops out of the ass, and there isn't enough time for the carbon to diffuse out, to move out of this central location. In a sense, these atoms are out like this, and they close down. So they were out here like this. Obviously, the bonds are not. That's electro, um, that's metallic bonding, covalent bonding, all the different types of bonding. There is no line. There's no stick holding these things together. There's the carbon in the centre there, and basically what we do is when we cool it, these iron atoms move in. If you do this slowly, you can also almost imagine that it goes 
and pops that carbon out and it turns back into this sphere centre cubic malarkey. But if we do it rapidly, there literally is not enough time for that carbon to get out. And once we've done, once we've done that, we've made uh, a Martin City compound uh, and these are crystals and it's, not, it's never perfect, unfortunately. So the rate at which you cool this down, in a sense, gives you how many, how, what percentage of your steel is the hard stuff that we want because we are trying to harden it. So this is all about the cooling. Just say if we cool it from 900 degrees to 200 degrees by dropping it in water or something like that and agitate it, give it a good shake, stuff like that. What you're going to have is just say we have a shaft. The same thing about the heating is the same thing about cooling. This inner region, this has cooled rapidly, so this has dropped that much, but the center is now still 600 degrees. It's, it's falling and it's conducting heat outwards to the colder regions, but we haven't hardened the absolute shit out of it. There is still soft regions. So if you could plot out, um, this is hard, this is soft, <laughs> the comments, yeah, I get it. Um, as you go through the cross section of this steel, so there's the centre region, you'll basically get something that's like this, where it's hard on the outside, it'll get softer towards the centre, and as you go further out to the outside perimeter, it gets hard again. Great, it's, it's almost like um, surface hardening. Great, it's not through hardening. Fantastic. But you've got to remember, this is with through hardening. You are dropping in water, the water will cool down the outside and slowly cool, or the energy will actually, it's the other way around, the energy, the heat will pass outwards to the colder regions. All good. This puts inherent stresses, this is why we do tempering, because now the whole thing's like, it's like being constricted, you're like fucking hell like that, and it's trying to push out. And that's what we call internal stresses. And this is why we temper it, heat it up slightly to about 200, 250, around up there, which lets the steel relax, but it stops this transition. There isn't enough energy for these atoms to go from face centre cubic to that body centre cubic that we want. This is all massively generalising. It's a lot more, gives free energy and all the rest. It's a lot more complicated than this. But you, you can get the point. So we are dropping the temperature from just say, just say 900 to 200 degrees. What happens if, and let's just say with this in water, Let's just say that we get 60% of the hard um, body centre cubic or the other one, the... Oh, still can't remember. Still can't remember. <laughs> but let's just say, forget the body centre cubic bit, let's just say we get 60% of the hard material that we want, right? And the 40% uh, is perlite or whatever. Cementite's also pretty hard but it all, the crystals don't like to, in a sense, share. <laughs> but um, we've got about 60% of what we want. So it's hard, but it's not as hard as it could be. Because this is randomly, it's not just on the outside of the surface, it's actually in the grain structure on the surface. What happens if we could drop it from this 900 degrees to, say, 0 degrees? But we don't use water. We use something like liquid nitrogen or something else inert. Obviously not oxygen, because this is boiling hot, it will just burn. <laughs> um, but we can use something, uh, I don't know if you can use ammonia, but let's just say we use liquid nitrogen, right? We use liquid nitrogen, which has a freezing point of 193, I believe. I'll change that if it's wrong. It's all off the top of my head. Um, but instead of using water, that's, let's just say is zero degrees, not zero degrees, that'd be fucking ice, you prick. Let's just say we are using water that's 20 degrees. This brings us down from 90, at 900 to 200 within about 10 seconds. Where if we use liquid nitrogen, we can bring it down to zero or maybe even cooler. You know, let's just say zero to, um, I don't know, minus 30, something like that. Or maybe even lower. The fact of the matter is, is that we are cooling it even uh, even quicker so we keep more of the hard material we want 
And let's just say we get 78%. Percent, idiot. 78%. Uh, 85%. Somewhere between there. These aren't accurate numbers. But you get what I'm saying. We cryogenically harden things. It's not the fact that the cold has hardened anything. It's transforming it from this structure, chemical, um, atomic structure that we want and maintaining that as we rapidly drop that temperature. We're basically cooling it quicker. That's all we're doing. That's literally all we're doing. How much of a difference does this make? Do you want it done on your engine? Fucking God, no. You will only do stuff like cryogenic hardening and stuff like that. It's not something that's required. Um, you only want cryogenic hardening for things that are meant to be hard. Um, cylinders, which we won't do because it's iron and use uh, aluminium and you've got nicosyl coating, so that's sorted. Generally do with crankshafts and conrods. And conrods don't need to be hardened because they have a bearing that actually sits in the conrod. The real thing that we'd ever really do this for is um, crankshafts, the crank pins, the main journals, stuff like that. Why? Because a crankshaft is extremely expensive and they do, you know, generally they do induction hardening. I've got a video here. This is them induction hardening um, the crank pins and main journals on a crankshaft. Awesome bit of kit. You can see basically it comes around clamps on. And it basically hardens. It's, it heats up the. Um, it's case hardening. It heats heats up the outside of the journal and then rapidly cools it. That makes that a hard wearing surface. So when you look at the interior of that crankshaft, you can see that there is a region. If you had to do a cross section of that journal, this is all hard, hard as a fucking coffin's coffin, because that's the wearing surface where the rest of it is quite soft, which is good, because the crankshaft goes through horrible torsional stresses, which is twisting, and we want the steel to be tough, but to be able to basically allow to flex, otherwise it will shear, it will just crack, and it'll be fucking horrible. Um, I've got some cutaway pictures, these are awesome. Someone's used, oh, what's it called, it begins with N, Ni something. Oh, it's, it's an acid mixture. It's methanol and nitric acid. And don't mix this at home. Some guy actually blew up recently. <laughs> at a college or a university. Nearly killed himself. Uh, got third degree burns or whatever. Trying to mix his own. It's methanol and nitric acid. And basically you use this stuff for welding. Um, when you want to look at welding penetration. It's one of the best things to use. Um, when you look at the penetration of welding. You can see grain structures and stuff. But here's some crankshafts that someone's... <laughs> fucking hell, what a mission. Someone split crankshafts in half, and we're going to use. You're going to see these pictures again because we're going to talk about the difference between forging, and casting, and machining. Um, but you can see here that you can see there's slight different grain boundaries and stuff at the actual outside where the journals are. You can see that, and that's where basically where that hard wearing hard surface is because that's where you want it. Hope that makes sense, and I'll see you in a bit.